Good morning. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the National Archives this morning, and a special welcome to our YouTube viewers. We are pleased to be hosting another in the series of the Nixon Legacy Forums. Since 2010, there have been more than 30 of these forums. Each of them brings together some of the men and women who worked in the Nixon administration and allows them to remember and reflect on the programs and policies they helped to define and develop during those eventful years between 1969 and 1974. They also recall and describe some of the personalities that influenced the course of those events. The Nixon Legacy Forums are a particularly vivid and lively form of oral history. They provide not only the story, but the critical backstory of how things really got done in the White House during the Nixon years. These Nixon F Legacy Forums, which are all available online, are a rich and unique source of information for scholars and students and citizens as the history of Richard Nixon and the Nixon administration continues to be written and debated and analyzed. I can report that there is considerable activity at the Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. In December, I announced the appointment of Michael Elsey as the library's director. Michael is already engaged with the Nixon Foundation in the exciting plans for the library's renovation, which will begin later this year, and Michael has joined us for his first Nixon Legacy Forum. Except for the Watergate exhibit that was opened in 2011, none of the library's exhibits have been updated since the building opened in 1990. The new exhibits will reflect the exponential advances in exhibit technology and interactivity that have developed over the last quarter century, and we expect to reopen in 2016. The last several Nixon Legacy Forums moderated by KT McFarland have focused on President Nixon's foreign policy. The opening to China, the diplomacy of the Vietnam War and the Paris Peace Accords, and this morning, detente and arms control with the USSR, or hard-headed detente, as President Nixon would have added. In his first inaugural address 46 years ago, in January 1969, President Nixon announced that he planned to pursue a policy of negotiation, not confrontation, with the Soviet Union. In May 1972, at the Moscow summit, President Nixon and General Secretary Brezhnev signed the SALT I Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. One historian called SALT the most significant arms control measure since the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922. All the documents and tape recordings covering the development of detente are at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Shepard, who will welcome you on behalf of the Nixon Foundation. Jeff. David, thank you. Hello and welcome. I'm uh, a transitional figure, positioned between the National Archivist, who uh, owns and maintains all of the records, and the people to my right who helped produce those records. Uh, as you know, if you've watched our series, we've produced uh, uh, over 30 of these. Uh, I was the youngest lawyer on President Nixon's staff, uh, joining the staff as a White House fellow right out of law school. Uh, but I worked on the domestic side. I became associate director of the Domestic Council. And so our early forums tended to favor domestic issues that I tended to know a little bit more about. But I found my counterpart, and I couldn't be more enthusiastic, younger, prettier, and far more talented than I am. And, and, and what we have is, is KT McFarland, but we, we get a few moments about her. Young Kathy Troya, a freshman at George Washington University, was looking for part-time work, and she found it. But her employer was the National Security Council, and her clerk typing job was typing the president's daily report on the midnight shift. So she was there from the very beginning, and then gradually through uh, uh, Nixon and Ford, and then back under Reagan, increased in responsibility and, 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 and in stature. So as today, she's not only Fox News national security analyst, but this very week uh, at the CPAC convention here in Washington, she's going to be named their uh, female uh, of the year. So Kat, I think we owe her a round of applause for this. Thank you very much. So we are, we are spectacularly pleased to have KT agree to moderate some of these forums for us, and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. That's far too generous, and I'm so happy you said everything you did. 
Uh, <laughs> let me start out by saying this is um, one of a several part series that we've done as, as the archivist and Jeffrey said on the Nixon administration's national security policy. It was only five years um, that Nixon was president, but they were a particularly fruitful time in American diplomacy. And a lot of people have called this the golden age of American foreign policy. The earlier forums we've had focused on how Kissinger and Nixon got national security decision making into the White House, and they wanted to centralize it. Others have talked about the Middle East shuffle, uh, shuttle diplomacy, um, the opening to China, and the ending of the Vietnam War. This is the final topic that we're going to deal with, and that's U.S. breakthroughs with the Soviet Union, arms control and detente. Kissinger said in his memoirs that Nixon devoted more attention to how to deal with the Soviet Union than any other foreign policy problem during his transition period. And that was because the United States had little historical experience, as Kissinger says, dealing with an adversary of comparable strength on a permanent basis. We had dealt with weaker adversaries before in short-term crises or even long-term crises, and we had dealt with powerful adversaries in a concerted, concentrated period of time in World War I and World War II. But this was the only time that we had an adversary of comparable strength that we tried to coexist with over decades. And added to it was nuclear weapons. So we couldn't ignore the Soviet Union, but we couldn't destroy the Soviet Union. And since the end of World War II, we had developed a policy of containment of the Soviet Union. A decade before these guys went to work, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had promised then Vice President Richard Nixon, we will bury you. And then in October of 1962, the United States and the Soviet Union came to the brink of war, potentially nuclear war, over the Cuban Missile Crisis. So when Nixon and Kissinger took office in January 1969, the Soviet Union seemed at that point to have the upper hand. They were a senior partner in the Sino-Soviet alliance. They had a chokehold on Eastern Europe. They'd supported successful communist liberation movements throughout the world. They had a defense buildup and were approaching nuclear parity with the United States. We, on the other hand, we were bogged down in a war in Southeast Asia. We seemed unable to win and incapable of ending. But by the time Nixon left office five years later, the US had reached detente with the Soviet Union and signed a series of significant arms control agreements. So joining us today are the men who made history. They were the key assistants to Henry Kissinger, who helped usher in this new era of US-Soviet detente and the arms control treaties. First is Winston Lord, raise your hand. Winston joined Kissinger's staff at the beginning of the Nixon presidency, and he was one of Kissinger's closest associates throughout the administration. And he worked on every aspect of American foreign policy, including the opening to China, arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union, Paris peace talks, and the Vietnam War. Winston, after leaving Kissinger's staff, went on to the State Department and then the Council on Foreign Relations, where he was the president, and later became US ambassador to China. Arthur Hartman was a foreign service officer who had had several European tours under his belt when he was tapped in 1973 to be Assistant Secretary of State at the same time that Kissinger went from being national security advisor to also being Secretary of State. Hartman accompanied Nixon and Kissinger at the third US-Soviet summit to the Soviet Union. He was later President Carter's ambassador to France and President Reagan's ambassador to the Soviet Union. Next is Phil O'Dean. He was a Pentagon official beginning in the Johnson administration, and he was one of the legendary McNamara whiz kids at the Pentagon. And he worked on every aspect of American foreign policy there, uh, but particularly American national security issues and arms control. He left the Pentagon and then joined the Nixon administration in 1971. And then he left the Nixon administration in 1973, and he went on to a very successful career in the private sector. But he always kept his hand in in various government and defense advisory groups. And then finally, Jan Lodel at the end. He also was a Pentagon official in the Johnson administration and another one of the legendary whiz kids. He left government in 1968 at the end of the Johnson administration to found one of America's premier software companies. He came back to government service. When Odin wanted to leave, he said, Lodel, you come. And Lodel replaced Odin on Kissinger's staff. Then Jan Lodel left Kissinger's staff in 1975, went to the private sector, and came back in the Carter administration as Under Secretary of Defense, and he's the former president of the Atlantic Council. So as you can see, they've all had careers before Kissinger, during Kissinger, and then very successful careers after.
Kissinger is known for having assembled one of the most talented staffs, national security staffs in history, and particularly people who then went on to the highest levels of government in subsequent administrations. But I think it's always interesting to find out how, you know, what's the personal backstory? So how did Henry Kissinger find you, Arthur Hartman? Well, I had run into him in the 60s when he was running his seminar at Harvard. I helped to recruit some of the young leaders from around the world to go to his seminar. And uh, he came down also for consultations uh, with senior officials in the department. And I was working for the Under Secretary of State. So that was my first exposure to him. And we kept in contact over the years after that. And then wasn't there a story where they wanted you to replace Kissinger at one point? Uh, not really, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were in was Europe. Some talk, there was yeah. some talk of my going back to become the uh, NSC uh, advisor. And um, luckily that did not happen, and I was brought back as Assistant Secretary for European Affairs in the State Department by Kissinger. <clears throat> Okay, Winston, what about you? Well, in 1969, I was working in the Pentagon. One of the first people Henry had joined him at the NSC staff was a man named Mort Halpern, who came over, helped him set up the NSC system. Mort asked me to go along with him, so I first met Kissinger in February 69. We had a chaotic uh, brief interview because he was going on for another meeting for about 15 minutes. Uh, I guess I didn't screw up the interview, but in any event, I guess Halpin was recommending me. So I uh, went into the NSC about a month after the president was inaugurated, started out helping to run the NSC system, uh, interagency meetings, and sort of a mini policy planning staff. Uh, we would send Kissinger memos, devil's advocate, criticizing policy. I sent a couple that were very critical. And to his credit, he doesn't like yes people. Uh, I caught his attention, so a year later I became a special assistant and was able to be involved in all these initiatives. Great. And what about you? How did Henry Kissinger find you over in the Pentagon with the whiz kids? Well, they, we had, there was a position on the NSA staff called Program Analysis, which was the group that did arms control analyses, defense issues, and related things. And we had a policy, in a sense, of bringing in people out of the Pentagon, out of that systems analysis whiz kid operation. Larry Lynn was first. Then Wayne Smith took his place, and I took Wayne's place, and eventually Jan. So I was sort of filling the slot on the NSC staff that was for the people out of the Pentagon analytic world. And then what was your response? When you say systems analysis, what did that mean? It was a way to uh, take a more systematic view of big defense an uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And it was brought in by a fellow named Alan Entoven, who had worked at RAND. And he called this, he worked for Charlie Hitch, who was the controller. And the idea was to have a much more systematic, analytic look at things, and really, in a sense, give the, a little like happened later on the NSC staff, give control over these big issues to the OSD staff, and they worked for McNamara as the people that did the underlying analytical kind of work. Okay, well, let me go back and say, before Winston came on Kissinger's staff and before you all joined it, Let's talk about what the situation was in 1968. We're to hear oh, about Jan. Oh, gosh, we didn't yeah. hear about you. We just heard that you replaced him. I'm sorry. So, WizKid. Well, my story's easy. Uh, I came because of Phil, of course, as he just described. Uh, and uh, I had worked with Phil in the Pentagon, and I had worked on strategic nuclear matters, which were hot in the White House in those days because of arms control and been responsible for doing the assured destruction calculations and some other complicated computer models, in addition to writing a lot of analytical papers and so forth. And I'd also worked on other defense policy matters. And so it seemed, I seemed to click with Henry in my interview, and uh, there we were. Is one of the reasons that, that Kissinger wanted the two of you with your analytical ability because he wanted then to get into arms control issues? Well, he was already in them. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I got there, uh, Assault One had already happened. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he had been uh, criticized for uh, some mistakes. We can get into that a little bit later by Scoop Jackson and, <coughs> and his team and uh, so forth. And I think he felt uh, that he, he actually needed some help on technical things to make sure that uh, they got uh, done correctly. In addition, he just uh, appreciated what Robert McNamara had done. I've heard, I've heard him say it many times. He thought that McNamara's approach to trying to be rational about defense policy and those sorts of things was uh, the right way to do things. And mm -hmm. uh, so he liked to have at least uh, one or two of us around who had uh, 
grown up in that environment. Yeah, I think Henry also is trying to get into the defense budget and get semi-control over that part of the bureaucracy like it did over state. But I think it's fair to say that Less Mel successful. Laird was a, a tougher <laughs> well, bureaucratic yeah, infighter. It's a little uh, tougher. Mel Laird, yeah. Donald Rumsfeld, some other people who uh, ended up uh, as secretary. That's right, Jim Schlesinger. In my role, I chaired a series of working groups, the verification panel working groups, the one that managed the SALT process. We had another one on defense budget issues, and uh, that was set up it was some push by uh, by Laird, who wanted a more systematic look at the White House about policy and what we needed and so on. But once uh, the pressure, be Laird decided it wasn't such a good idea. So I chaired the working group. We got nothing done because <laughs> the Pentagon just resisted it. It was a more so. equal fight than it was with state. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't yeah. Henry write his book on arms control earlier? It, it, was, it was really his first major success. Uh, and uh, I'm jumping way ahead, but I remember in, in the, the last Nixon summit when we decided to do a threshold test ban treaty and write it in the middle of the night, and I was chatting with Henry, and I began to give him a briefing on what this thing would be all about. And he rattled off a bunch of things, and uh, he knew more than I knew. And later, I went back to that early book. He had written an entire chapter on threshold <laughs> test ban treaties way back when he was a young scholar. I think that's an interesting point to make because Kissinger is often accused of, well, he knew all about diplomacy and balance of power, but he didn't know the nuts and bolts of military things and strategic nuclear weapons. But your experience was he really did know his stuff, and you were brought in to Yeah, do he that. did know them in a policy sense. Uh, he wasn't very good with numbers. He couldn't calculate numbers too well. That's whether, why I got you guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, but let's go now then to 1968. You were all, everybody was in government in 1968, but it was a very momentous time. Um, Phil, why don't you talk, when you were at the Pentagon, what were the big issues that you had with the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, especially the, there had already sure. been an arms control process yeah. ongoing. Well, the, you know, by the mid-60s, the U.S., this whole business of missile gaps is long forgotten, and the U.S. was clearly ahead in, you know, in missiles and submarines and bombers and kind of all aspects, not only numbers, but also qualitative aspects. But as you got later in the 1960s, the Soviets were, begin, were building new missile sites at, a, at quite a pace, began building submarines in large numbers, six or eight a year at that point in time. And we had largely finished our buildup, a uh, thousand minute man. Uh, we had about 500 bombers. We were building submarines, but decided not to keep building, but instead build a brand new generation of much larger, more capable submarines. But that was years in the future. So our buildup was done. They were still building. And as a result of that, there was a lot of interest in ABM, very controversial, a lot of opposition, a lot of support for it, but a variety of different types of ABM systems. So those are the big issues. But by 67, really, McNamara, Rusk, and the president all decided that you know, a arms control agreement with the Soviets in this area was very important. And there was great support for it across the government. Uh, a lot of work went into it. There were various consultations with the Russians. Uh, unclear how interested they really were. Mm -hmm. Their only interest was limiting ABM because I think they were very concerned about the Soviets' interest. Soviets' it, interest because yeah. you know we clearly, systems. if we did it, would be much more capable technologically in building a system. So that was their only interest. But by one, of, one yeah. of the interesting things about the Russian view of ABM right. is that despite all the doubts in our public about whether the thing would actually work all the time, the Russians believed the Americans could actually exactly. do it. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that sort of led them to be more worried about that than And hence, our they, that, was, that was the deal they wanted, yeah. was to limit exactly. our anti-ballistic missile yeah. defense system. So by late 67 and into 68, there was a lot of interest, a lot of discussion. Uh, and finally, there was an agreement in sort of mid-68 that uh, there would be uh, discussions. There was going to be a meeting uh, announced, I think, January, uh, excuse me, July 19th, they announced, or they were going to announce two days later there was going to be a meeting on arms control at the end of September. And uh, finally, for the first time, we got both sides agreeing to do it. The next day, they invaded Czechoslovakia, and that was mm -hmm. the end of the whole thing. It all went away for the rest so of the by, So when they invaded Czech Czechoslovakia, the, uh, the Lyndon the Johnson stopped. solved, everything just stopped. stopped. Jan, let me ask you, why was, it, why was there a push to all of a sudden, why did we need negotiations? You know, we were the superior nuclear power. What Was there a change in thinking that happened at the time? Well, there were some technological changes that looked like they were going to make the nuclear balance even more dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, one was ABM, as uh, Phil uh, indicated, because if one side deployed the ABM, you would have the usual situation where uh, 
The other side would worst case analysis and say, well, that thing might work, so therefore I need a huge amount of additional missiles to overwhelm it. So that would generate some arms race pressures uh, back and forth there. The biggest question was, the biggest issue though was the advent of multiple warheads on top of missiles so that you could uh, dramatically increase the capability of these missiles. Uh, and uh, the United States was way ahead in those, but we knew the Russians were eventually coming along. So you had these two new technologies, ABM and MIRV, which looked like they might just really break things loose. <clears throat> and uh, that provided some incentive to say, wait a minute, you know, we're not, go we're not gonna end up with anything better and it may be much worse. Mm -hmm. The crisis stability yeah. of the situation may be lower, there may be a higher chance of nuclear war. Let's see if we can negotiate a deal. Quick fact, uh, the Poseidon missile, sea-based missile, uh, instead of being, one missile could carry anywhere from 10 to 14 separate warheads, each independently targetable. So, you know, incre incredible increase in capability. And I think that worried, clearly worried the Soviets. As are, well as us. That worried us if the Soviets had it. So there was an incentive by, by late 1968, 69, let's get on with it. Yeah, exactly. So when the Nixon administration came in, what was their thinking? They looked at what Johnson had done, there were no negotiations going. You were so there when, but... What, what was the president... Well, let, let's put this in the broadest context. Mm -hmm. uh, when Nixon and Kissinger came in, as you briefly mentioned, we were bogged down in the Vietnam War. We had an uneasy relationship with the Soviets on top of the, the Czechoslovakia invasion, and we had no contact with China. So Nixon and Kissinger's highest priorities all happened to be with communist countries. End the war in Vietnam more stable relationship with Moscow, open up with Beijing, and they were all interrelated. At the same time, you had the domestic scene, which was also undercutting <coughs> uh, posture abroad. Anti-Vietnam War protests, assassinations, race riots, uh, tremendous turmoil in this country. So they faced a very challenging uh, environment. <coughs> so the three top priorities in foreign policy were the ones I mentioned, and they were interrelated. In order to have better relations with the Soviets, you open up with China to get uh, Moscow's attention. Uh, you keep China a little bit nervous because with China, it's after 25 years of isolation and no normalization, it was mostly discussions, not agreements. Whereas with Moscow, you're making agreements and China can see it's concrete. And by opening up with both these giants, patrons of Hanoi, you put pressure on the North Vietnamese to strike a reasonable deal. So this was the conceptual strategic policy of the president as he set out in 69, and he, by 72, he managed to achieve all three of these goals. So it really was a three-legged a three stool. You, right. needed, you needed to get out of Vietnam, you needed to open with China, you needed a arms Stay. control with the Soviet Union. Right. And no, no one of those legs would stand without the other. Well, they all reinforced each other, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Additionally, there wasn't a lot of interest, my impression was, uh, in arms control <laughs> assault negotiations. It was kind of that given to Jerry Smith and acted right. a kind of developed. No, it was more establishing posture. we can get yeah. into the strategy versus yeah. the, the uh, Soviets. Mm -hmm. It was more of a strategy overall relationship, right, exactly. which arms <laughs> control was a component. A component, but not, yeah. not the component, yeah. just yeah. a component. The basic strategy with, with Moscow, and my colleagues here can edit me here. Uh, first of all, Nixon was not naive about Moscow. You had Russian nationalism, you had communist ideology, you had Soviet expansionism, mm -hmm. a trifecta. So he knew he was dealing with a tough adversary. On the other hand, you had nuclear weapons and a dangerous world. So he, his feeling, I think, was we, we're way beyond massive retaliation of Dulles and Eisenhower, because either you do everything or do nothing. And containment, useful as it was, wasn't enough to make a stable world and a stable bilateral relationship. So something more was needed. And as you quoted, negotiation, I wouldn't say instead of confrontation exactly, but along with uh, realistic uh, need to resist the Soviets at the same time. Mm -hmm. Whether it was in the Middle East, Africa, or Latin America, we would push back, sort of a reflection of containment, whenever they press forward. At the same time, <coughs> negotiate in concrete national interest, not just general atmosphere, whether it was arms control or anything else. So, using sticks and carrots, using uh, pressure when necessary, opening to China to get their attention, visiting Poland and Romania and Eastern Europe to show the Soviets couldn't speak for the entire communist world, but also negotiating in specific areas of interest like arms control to try to make a more stable relationship. 
Whose idea was this? Was this Nixon? Was this Kissinger? Like most of the tremendous foreign policy uh, uh, initiatives in this period, uh, you give Nixon the, the ultimate credit. He was president. He had to make the tough decisions. And he had the strategic grasp that no other president has had, in my opinion, in this area. But Kissinger, independently, because they didn't know each other well when they started out, had reached mostly the same conclusion. So they reinforced each other. They both deserve credit. But Kissinger is the first to say, the president comes first, mm -hmm. with some reluctance sometimes. <laughs> uh, the negotiations that we had had with the Soviet Union on arms control, the ones that stopped after the Czechoslovak invasion, how were those different than what Nixon proposed to do? And I'll anybody jump in with that. Well, I think when said, uh, you know, in, in the Johnson administration, it was a arms control, strategic arms control negotiation. That was it. In this case, as when said, it was part of a much broader mm -hmm. set of uh, negotiations and interaction with the Russians, the Chinese, and the Vietnamese. So it was a, a very different conceptual basis. And what were the, so what was the administration's goal then when they started relations with the Soviet Union? They well, wanted to the, link on everything. On the arms, arms control, control side, that was the piece that I was involved in. Mm -hmm. But on that side, uh, the, there was a lot of discussions during 1969, some with the Russians. And Vian Henry began to develop his relationship with Dobrynin. Uh, and the Russians had a real interest in ABM. As we said earlier, they were very fearful of our capability, potential capability there. We were interested because we saw this buildup continuum of offensive systems, especially ICBMs. We wanted to limit those. And there was enormous opposition in the country uh, on weapons systems, on ABM in particular. Defense budgets were under attack. So there was a, a real interest in trying to find a way to begin getting arms around it. But they started negotiations in the fall of 1969 mm -hmm. in, in Helsinki, uh, very broad discussions and so on, went on next year. But not an awful lot happened over the next 18 months, uh, back and forth on different positions. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of specific things happened, but not till early, uh, um, in early 71, uh, when Dobrynin and Kissinger worked out a, a broad deal, which basically said, uh, a limited ABM capability on either side and limits on offensive weapons, a freeze on offensive weapons. And by that, they meant ICBMs primarily. They weren't thinking at that point in time, or at least weren't talking about you know, you, submarine you mentioned launch missiles. Dobrynin for a minute. Um, one of the things that we have seen with these previous um, panels is that there seemed to be two negotiations going on. There was maybe the public one that was happening, whether it was over Vietnam, nothing with China. But there was also the secret negotiations. Well, even were going China, on. you had the Warsaw and Geneva talks, as sort of public uh, So there was something propaganda. public where yeah. everybody was focused on, right. but the real work was being done in these back channel negotiations. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about um, Ambassador de Brennan. Who was he and why was he so critical? Well, I'll let others talk about that, but before we get to that, yeah. in addition to the arms control dimension, more broadly to answer your question, Nixon and Kissinger were looking for a more stable relationship in a very dangerous nuclear world. And therefore, there was sort of three elements uh, beyond what I've already mentioned. There was negotiations, but they had to be concrete and in the self-interest of both sides. So make progress where there's common interests, like limiting the arms race, if we could find a way. Uh, secondly, mutual restraint, to try to t show the Soviets it was not in either side's interest and it was dangerous to keep pressing the envelope mm -hmm. in various parts of the world. So mm -hmm. therefore, resist them, like in the Middle East, and uh, as we'll talk about the Cuban uh, sub-base. Uh, uh, and then thirdly, the concept of linkage, uh, which was not always employed. In fact, Nixon felt more strongly about linkage, for example, getting Moscow to lean on Hanoi for a peace agreement and not do a lot of other stuff unless they did that. Kissinger was more interested in a broad approach. Uh, but they both believed in making clear that the Soviets couldn't pick and choose and the overall behavior of the Soviet Union would help determine our posture. So unlike the Johnson administration, which was negotiating arms control, yeah. Nixon said, we're not going to negotiate that unless we get other things along with it, Vietnam, et cetera? Well, that, we'll get back, back to that. But he was more interested. And in his so-called secret plan to end the Vietnam War was really to get the Soviets and the Chinese to lean on Hanoi for an agreement. Mm -hmm. And so he felt very strongly that the Soviets, as the major arms supplier to the Vietnamese, should help out. And there were times when. Uh, he was impatient that Kissinger didn't get more out of the Russians in that aspect and was trying to do too much in other areas. But there was general agreement between the two of them. I don't want to exaggerate that. So what about de Brennan? Go back to him. He, he was the Soviet ambassador to the United States, had been the ambassador for a long time. 
We were having all these public negotiations through the State Department in Europe and elsewhere, but there was something else going on in the West Wing of the White House. Well, he was a very, he'd been there, what, since the early 60s, he'd been there for a long time, knew the United States well. He was a very senior person within the hierarchy in, in Russia as well, so he had access to the very top. So he had great, influ at least great <coughs> access and probably some influence in Moscow. So he was a perfect uh, kind of person for Henry to work with, but Art, yeah, you probably knew him. What we're not sure of is how much influence he had in Moscow. Mm -hmm. In a couple of instances, he appeared to have it because he had mastered the technicalities of right. these negotiations, which people like Romiko hadn't. So he was kind of educating his people in Moscow at the same time. Mm -hmm. Also, it fit into a pattern that Henry liked of dealing with people outside the sort of public sphere. And uh, I think the same thing on China. Absolutely. Uh, on other things well, secret in Europe. Secret of Vietnam. Uh, sure. You know, that's was his mode of work. Mm -hmm. And he loved the idea of being able uh, to talk privately, he thought, with Debrinen. And Debrinen really used that position uh, to bolster his own position. So he was kept there by the Soviets for a very long period of time. And uh, they did rely on him getting information from Washington to them. And he was very clever about developing his own contacts here in Washington, on the Hill, in the executive branch. I mean, everybody was Dobrynin's friend, so to speak. <laughs> His memoirs reveal that he didn't have all that much influence at home, but he certainly had access in Washington. Yeah, Henry and Dobrynin used to meet what they call the map room of the White House, uh, usually without anybody else uh, present. Henry paints a very in-depth and admiring portrait of Dubrinin in his memoirs. Obviously, Dubrinin would always present and defend Soviet interests, but Henry felt that he was willing, unlike most communist ambassadors in particular, to explore potential uh, steps forward without committing his government. And they had an extremely good relationship, and I think it's fair to say it was absolutely mm -hmm. crucial to the whole uh, American-Soviet relationship during these years. Was something different going on between Kissinger and Dobrynin and Nixon? Were they having a different kind of negotiation than the public negotiations that were happening in Europe at the time? Well, it was certainly more detailed. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> Henry's mode of operation, again, <laughs> was sometime to send people off in a general negotiation, which he formed the framework for, uh, while he sort of explored the ex more possible uh, mm -hmm. extremes, and that led to a result in the negotiation. And these gentlemen can sure. talk about the arms control dimension of this, but the one exception really was the Berlin Agreement we'll get to, where he did work very closely with our ambassador uh, in Germany, Kenneth Rush, uh, and, and it was more an exception uh, to yes. other issues which were handled almost strictly by Henry and his staff. Yeah. I think part of it was the nature of the problem when it came to arms control, our, our main subject here, in that you were talking about these existential issues for each nation. Uh, you know, if things really went wrong here and there were a nuclear so, war, it would be catastrophic. And so they had to be dealt with at the very top level. And the problem was the normal diplomatic mechanisms didn't make it easy to deal with things at mm -hmm. the top level. Whereas Henry could go talk to Dobrin and he could then walk into Nixon's office and show him a note or suggest a note to be sent directly to Brezhnev, hand it to Dobrin and, and know that Dobrin would get it directly to Brezhnev and his close staff and that it wouldn't yeah. be uh, uh, interfered with by the Soviet military or by the Soviet bureaucracy. And, and so it, it, it really was a channel between the leaders, between uh, Nixon and in our days Brezhnev, uh, that... Uh, uh, was what the uh, Dobrynin uh, connection was most important. Let me, let me ask both of you, because you were both in the Pentagon, you were in the bureaucracy, <coughs> you were part of what Nixon and Kissinger and Dobrynin and Brezhnev were trying to avoid. Was it an effective way, do you think, of dealing with these very serious Yeah, I, I think it was, because um, the delegation, uh, you know, the U.S. delegation that Jerry Smith headed, was under very tight wraps. I, I, I ran something called the Verification Panel, which Jan later did. We put together, debated it, and put together a position uh, 
uh, which the president then signed in an ISDM. And they were really bound by this, and they were given relatively little flexibility to try mm -hmm. fallbacks and things like that. They really had a position. They had to s s position it, stand with it, and push hard on it. They might have some minor variations, but they couldn't kind of look at all these variations and explore things. They were not permitted to do that. And the Russians had trouble doing it, too, because the Russian military, senior military person there, clearly was a powerful member. He's the only one that understood any of these military kind of issues. The others knew almost nothing about him. So the formal, uh, the formal discussions really were uh, not a good place to explore something as complex and uh, with as many sort of variations and so on as, as this was. You, know, you, you talked about um, the period between 69, 70, 71. You know, Winston has outlined with the ambitions that the president had, but really it was sort of stalemated, wasn't it? In, this, in, in 1970, 71, you were having negotiations, but nothing was yeah, happening. Yeah, very little progress was made. And, and, uh, but then in 71, things began to change. I think uh, uh, clearly uh, Brezhnev began to get greater control. He probably had more interest in this than his predecessors did. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this breakthrough in May of 71, in which we got this agreement, uh, which said both sides are really serious about negotiating agreement, and it covered <coughs> two of the key elements, uh, an ABM treaty with sort of small limited capability on each side and a control or freeze over the offensive ICBM buildup the Russians were doing. So this was an important step and things really accelerated after that. You can talk well, to the other things. Before we got to that yeah. point though, <clears throat> 69 and 70 was clearly a mixed picture. Uh, we've outlined <clears throat> what Nixon and Kissinger were trying to do with the Soviets, but it wasn't working very well. Uh, there was the slow progress on the arms control front. There was uh, a series of crises. In fact, in a three-week period, you had three crises at the same time. In the Middle East, the Cuban sub-base, and Chile. Chile's not part of our discussion today. Mm -hmm. So it was a busy summer of 1970. Uh, the, without going into detail, uh, the Russians were behind efforts to, to get missiles into Egypt and to have Syria uh, challenge Jordan. Uh, that was resolved with some U.S. muscle flexing. The Russians tried to establish a submarine base in San Fuegos, Cuba, uh, and that was a tense moment. And of course, had echoes of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and again, with skillful diplomacy, I think, uh, the Russians backed off, or the Soviets backed off, and they settled for visits to uh, the sub-base, but not a permanent construction uh, there. Meanwhile, there was back and forth on a possible summit. Uh, the Russians were, or the Soviets were, frankly, insisting on an entrance price before you even have a summit. Sort of basically saying, we want to make progress in salt along the lines that we want. Uh, we want to sort of be anti-Chinese. We want a confidence on security in Europe. So they had, and wanted the, uh, Nixon to agree to these things before there even would be a summit. And so that was slow progress. Uh, <clears throat> actually, we got to the point where Nixon was sort of ready for a summit in the 70s after all the, in 1970. Uh, but I think Kissinger slowed that down. There was a slight tactical disagreement. Uh, but the Russians dragged their feet, and I've got to pay a price for it as we get to the next mm -hmm. stage, namely, therefore, we went to China first. Let me, before we get to that part of it, let me just ask you, Arthur. So you were in Europe at the time. How was Europe looking at this? They were seeing the crises well, that several, Winston's talking about. several problems they faced in Europe. One was that there was on the left side, principally, uh, a feeling that they ought to move toward a more <coughs> neutral system, which of course was anathema to us because that would mean that it would be very difficult for us to keep a true presence in NATO in Europe. And that was necessary to have kind of a bulwark as the background to some of these negotiations with the Soviets. Uh, after a while, uh, what, what they did was to try to bring us closer to the Germans who were championing this idea of a not quite neutral Europe, but at least an opening to the o East. Ostpolitik? Uh, Willy Brandt. It was the Ostpolitik. Yeah. And uh, it was first led by Willy Brandt when he was chancellor. And then the other Russians, uh, the other Germans, uh, picked it up but they did it in a more cooperative way, and it led to the kind of agreements that were uh, eventually uh, put forward in the Security Conference on Europe, which at first, Nixon and Kissinger were very 
unenthusiastic, to say the least, about the idea of having such an overall mm -hmm. security conference. The Russians love that kind of thing because they love agreements that seem to settle problems in a broad way, but which didn't tie their hands at all. And so uh, that had to be, a lot of things had to be put into that agreement to make it a firm one where the Russians would take real steps, uh, among other things, not to upset the borders that were set, which they've now done, of course, in the Ukraine. <laughs> but that was a violation of the eventual agreement that was reached on security in Europe. The other thing that uh, both Kissinger and Nixon felt was we've got to find a way to bring the major powers closer together. And Kissinger developed this idea that the four foreign ministers could get together from time to time without upsetting the rest of the NATO members. And they did it in the guise of discussing Berlin, where we all had special... And the four were... The four were Germany, France, Britain, and, and ourselves. And so every time the NATO ministers would get together with all the members of NATO, the night before, the four ministers would meet together. And below that, there was a group that I sat on and, and uh, uh, which prepared the meetings of mm -hmm. the four ministers. But it was a way of bringing the Europeans more into the kind of thinking that we were going through on how to handle a Russian problem that none of us could deal with individually. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned um, 1971, everything changed. Now, let me mention one other thing. Yeah. At the same time in the United States, you had the Mansfield proposal to take 150,000 troops out of Europe. Okay, so this is that the anti-war movement That was going on the same time, early in 1971, yeah. so you had all this, and that was a very close call. and They almost passed that, so you had all this pressure on the U.S. side vis-a-vis -vis our forces in Europe as well. By the so, way, in that case, Nixon and Kissinger called in a bunch of wise men, Dean Acheson and John McCloy, and I forget all the other names. Yeah to try to lobby against this uh, pressure exactly. to take out our troops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, Each time yeah. that came up in the Congress, there was a report. Once they asked Dean Acheson to do the report, then they asked David Bruce to do the report. And that report was used as a sort of way to, to battle the Congress. And this on is these an actually withdrawals. an interesting point, because you know, th this was a crisis that the Nixon administration was having. And yet they were able to look at, at senior officials from previous administrations of other political parties That's to right. come and, and the you know the foreign policy divisions no. and at water's edge. That's so right. they were really able to establish yeah. a sort of continuity of American foreign policy. No. Well, the, the, the basis was the NATO treaty. Mm -hmm. And that was something that they all agreed on, the importance of it, both in dealing with the Russians but also of keeping Europe together and not having them go off in separate directions. Mm -hmm. And, and, and keeping was, U.S. troops yeah. in Europe. Yes. This, this Wiseman's group, really, I was one of the liaisons with it. They really were constructive. It makes you yearn for the days of bipartisanship and foreign policy. And it was an extremely effective instrument to ward off these isolationist pressures. Let's go down to 1971. We, we've seen in our previous forums that 1971 yeah. really was a critical year for everything. It was a critical year in relations with China and the Vietnam negotiations, but obviously in the, with the Soviet Union. So talk to me about what happened. I think the first thing was President um, Nixon in May of 1971. He, as you, Phil Dean, you pointed out, he gave a speech saying, well, these are the major outlines of an agreement we want to have with the Soviet Union. That was in May. What happened in July? Well, maybe they want to dwell a little bit more on the May Agreement. I don't know whether yeah. you felt you've covered that enough before. Yeah, we that was it. really, I mean, it, it turned out there was a lot more to be done afterwards because, but it sort of said to both sides, we're going to go ahead with arms control. Right. And it, it addressed the two most critical issues at that time, ABM and uh, buildup of Soviet missiles. So, right, that so really, offensive and defensive. And I think everybody then said, hey, we're going to have an agreement. And they were aiming at, you know, the next year to get ready to have an agreement signed and ready for a summit. And the so. Soviets was saying the same thing at that time then in May of 1971. Nixon said it to the American people, but the Soviets were saying it to their domestic. And joint announcements. I joint announcement. Published right. letters and all that sort of stuff. Okay, yeah. so, so this is May. What happens in July? Well, 
In another forum, we've discussed in great depth the China opening. And for two years now, uh, Nixon and Kissinger were establishing private communications through Pakistan with the Chinese and publicly making various signals and policies and pronouncements to condition various audiences what was coming. The Russian experts at the time, the Soviet experts in the State Department and elsewhere, and I may get the names wrong, <clears throat> but it included George Kennan and uh, Tommy Thompson and Foy Kolo, I I'm leaving somebody out. They all said, don't open up with China because it's going to mess up relations with the Soviet Union. These are terrific people, great patriots, but they were entirely wrong, and Nixon and Kissinger were entirely right. Namely, the opening to China had many motivations. I won't go into depth because we've covered it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But one of the key ones was to improve relations with the Soviets by getting their attention. I have never seen, in my witnessing or participation, any single event that had such a major impact on another country as this had on the, on the Soviets. We, we did begin to make some progress in May 71 yeah. on arms control, but otherwise you had this situation I described earlier of the crises and mm -hmm. so on in 1970 and 69. Within, we, we finished the secret trip of Kissinger to China <clears throat> July 15. The president announced it on July 15. We finished a few days earlier. De Brenin was in Kissinger's office four days after that announcement in a very conciliatory mode. <laughs> they, they immediately start talking about a Moscow summit. Uh, they basically made a breakthrough within one week on a Berlin agreement. They started making progress on an accidental war agreement. All of this within weeks and setting a, a Russian summit. Now, the I keep saying Russian, I guess, I should keep saying Soviets, but it's back. This yeah. is somewhat ironic because we have been trying to set up a summit with the Soviets uh, back and forth for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, as of '71 in the spring, they were still dragging their feet, as I said, with conditions. Uh, we gave them one last chance on the way to China. It was a public trip, and we were in Bangkok on our way to Pakistan for the secret trip to China. And Al Haig was instructed to call in, in fact, Brennan's deputy at that point, Voronsov, give him one last chance to set a date for the summit. And once again, the Soviets said, no, 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 we're not ready yet. So the idea was Haig was to call me, Haig being Kissinger's deputy, of course, manning the White House in Henry's absence, about the result of this meeting. He got me at 3 a.m. in the morning in Bangkok on July 5th. He used double talk, which would not have fooled a, a six-year-old uh, in terms of what the hell he was talking about. Basically, he said that, once again, the Russians turned it down. So, of course, that meant we ended up having a China summit before, before a Russian, Russian summit. summit. And, of course, and we Russians pointed that out to Debrina that yeah. they lost their chance, you know. And the Russians had no idea this was coming. Absolutely no idea. Now, they were briefed by us 45 minutes before the San Clemente announcement of the China secret trip by Kissinger. Uh, we, we told the Russians, so they did get 45 minutes warning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, so then what happened after, so this is July of 1971, immediate and sudden response by the Russian, right. by the Soviet Union. And then as you're negotiating, what were you seeing in the negotiations? But the, the, there, after the May announcement, there still were some major issues to be sorted out. Uh, one was what did this, you know, this limited ABM, what was it? Was it one site, two sites? national capital, missile defense, back and forth, and a huge debate internally within the U.S. government over this, and still a bunch of people that wanted zero, no ABM at all. And I think Henry knew from discussions at O'Brennan this was absolutely a non-starter, but there were a lot of people pushing it hard. And uh, so that was the first issue. A very, uh, very vigorous debate went on for months. The other one that came into it in July, uh, somewhat for the first time, was the NSC staff initially pushed my staff. I was just before I got there, that we also ought to include submarine launch ballistic missiles in this agreement. We only were talking about, it's talked about a freeze in offensive forces, didn't define it, but the understanding was it was, it was ICBMs, land-based missiles. And I think the NSC staff initially, and then with great support from the Pentagon and elsewhere, I think even ECTA and state were supportive, we ought to try to negotiate SLBMs, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles. There was great, uh, reluctance to do it by the negotiators. They didn't think there was a chance, but uh, uh, we did a lot of work on it. At that time, we had a big advantage. We had 41 submarines. 
uh, and 600 plus missiles. They had 22 operational subs, they had 15 under construction, uh, so 30 some, but they were building six or eight a year. And everybody said, if we don't find a way to limit this, right. they're gonna have 60, 70, 80, 90 in four or five years. And we had on, no ongoing construction program because we'd stopped it to build this new Trident system that was uh, five, six, seven years down the pike. So after a lot of debate internally, the delegation was told they had to try to include SLBMs mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the agreement. Uh, great reluctance to do this. The other issue that had been back and forth was control over radars, ABM radars, which our people felt was absolutely essential in any ABM ban. There was always concern about upgrading air defense missiles, something called the Talon system, which was very controversial. Uh, and they still had to sort that out. So there were some significant issues that had to be negotiated before the summit. And uh, I think the bureaucracy was very worried that Henry and the president were gonna negotiate this in, in Moscow the next year. But a very contentious period within the bureaucracy, and then a long slog with the Russian delegation mm -hmm. to try, to try to get them to accept SLBMs and to uh, negotiate the radars and some other exotic systems and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, I think there's an interesting point to make here from a historical perspective. We had a wonderful system for finding out what they were doing in this buildup of uh, their missile system and their technology and so forth. There was practically no information created in that whole period about what this was doing to the Russian economy. Mm -hmm. And we later learned from Gorbachev, among others, that the Politburo never knew what a drain this tremendous buildup was mm -hmm on the Russian economy and how weak it left the Russian economy as they went toward this big buildup. Was there any consideration given to that when you were doing the negotiating? No, I, I don't, never mentioned. I mean, there was always some interest in trade and things like that, but that was a whole separate track done by commerce and elsewhere. And there were some trade agreements here and there, and but it was not part of the, the world I was in. So, was so, so when you were doing the, the negotiating and you were looking at it from the Russians were vulnerable because they were worried about China. Did you think, well, they, maybe they're vulnerable because they're worried about their economy, they can't keep up these high levels of defense? No, spending? I think uh, it was pretty universal uh, misapprehension here about just how weak the Soviets were. I mm -hmm. mean, we had a tendency, at least I don't remember uh, thinking <coughs> we have tremendous leverage because of their weak yeah. economy. Uh, but by the way, with the, with the, I should have mentioned in, in dealing with the Russians, we had these other elements, named, and we'll get back to them, but keep them out of the Middle East and get them to help. Right, there were other things going yeah, on at the and, same time. And also try to get them to help end the Vietnam War, which we can get to in a minute. Right. You know, I think when, you probably know better than I, but my sense, what Henry's view was, that they were really on a roll, the Russians were. They building up this, you know, doing all sorts of these adventures, building up their military very aggressively. We were under attack, our troops in Europe, the Vietnam, all the anti-war stuff, defense right. budget cuts. Right. You know, we were, you know, we were in a very weak position. I think part of the effort here is to get as much done as we could, uh, because they were. You know, so the perception of them was, anybody, in fact, more powerful than they exactly. turned out later yeah. to realize. Yeah. And there was no attempt then to target their economy, which is what Reagan then did, you know, subsequently. Reagan did it much more consciously, I think. Yeah. yeah. All right. T talk to me then about. So we have. July of 71, the secret trip. Then you have an intense interest or an increased interest on the part of the Soviet Union to do negotiating. So you're seriously negotiating. February of 72, Nixon goes to China, week that changed the world. And then what happened? Well, we began to look toward the agreed May summit, uh, late May summit in, in scheduled for Moscow. And of course, Brezhnev and his cohorts had an interest in making sure they came off because we'd been a very successful one in China. By the way, in the Shanghai communique at the end of the president's visit to China, we had a little clause in there opposing hegemony. The U.S. and China agreed to oppose hegemony anywhere in the world. Now, guess who they were talking about? <laughs> so that got Moscow's attention. So what happened uh, as we got closer to the summit, it coincided with a huge North Vietnamese offensive, again, the spring offensive, the Easter offensive, starting March 30, 1972. Uh, and this, again, brought back to what I said earlier, that Nixon felt that the Russians were responsible for supplying North Vietnam and they had leverage over them. 
and to a lesser extent the Chinese. So Henry went on a secret trip. I was with him April 20, I believe, 1972, uh, for two reasons. Uh, and by the way, we took Tabrina with us on our plane because we took off in a hurry. Uh, <clears throat> one was to try to get the Russians to rein in the, the Hanoi's offensive. Uh, and, and secondly, was to prepare for the summit. The, so the early part of that secret trip uh, was spent on Vietnam, and the Russians really weren't being very helpful. Kissinger felt there was only so much we could expect them to do, and we shouldn't lose arms control and all the other things we had going as we headed toward the summit because they wouldn't fully come through on Vietnam. So he made some progress on SALT and on other issues mm -hmm. while we were in Moscow. But we were getting heated cables from Nixon via Hague. We're never quite sure how <laughs> joint yeah. they were. Yeah. Basically <laughs> saying, don't start agreeing to all this other stuff until they come through in Vietnam. Henry pushed the envelope in his instructions, frankly, but thinking the president would finally agree. And, and not violating instructions, but basically saying, we've got to make progress even if we can't get to do everything we want them to do on Vietnam. So it was very successful in setting up the, the summit. On Vietnam, the Russians got Hanoi, and we got Hanoi to agree to a secret meeting on May 2nd after this secret meeting in Moscow, with a lot of secret meetings. Uh, uh, but we made it clear that we were going to react even stronger to the Hanoi Offensive if nothing came out of that meeting. Nothing did come out of the meeting. So the president, a week later on May 9th, gave a major speech. And I remember going up to Camp David with Henry in a helicopter to consult with the president and his speechwriter about this speech. And we were ambivalent. We felt you had to res respond strongly to what Hanoi was doing, both so South Vietnam wouldn't be overrun and also to set up a possible mm -hmm. breakthrough in negotiations. But we felt that what we were going to do, which was mine Haiphong as well as bombing around Hanoi. And that was a real escalation of the Vietnam War. The, the real esca well, they escalated first well, but by they, their but, but offensive with divisions pouring over the Haiphong. DMZ. We had never mined Haiphong. We had never blockaded that's, the harbor. That's harbor. right. So this was a major step and a courageous one for the reasons I mentioned. Also, Nixon felt that he could not go to Moscow while American and Vietnamese soldiers are being killed by Soviet arms supplied to the North Vietnamese, mm -hmm. that he would look very weak. So we had to have a strong reaction. Many of his advisors, including Henry, uh, I'll let him speak for himself, but most of us thought that we might well lose the, uh, the summit meeting that the Russians would cancel it because of this huge escalation, counter-escalation on our part. Nixon felt, no, they need the summit too much, and we can have our cake and eat it too. Nixon was right. Uh, and they went ahead uh, with the summit. Yeah. Uh, Explain uh, why that was so important, though, because mining Haiphong Harbor, whose ships would have been in Haiphong Harbor? Well, one Russian was, ship was hit. Russian. And yeah. whose ship? It was a Russian ship. Well, yeah, I think the Chinese got hit, too. I'm not, I'm yeah. not clear but, on that. But, I mean, but, so this was a real roll of the dice at that point. Of the dice. And, yeah. and the summit easily could have been canceled by the Soviet Union, right? They could have said... Well, Nixon felt they wouldn't. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And most advisors thought they, they probably would, but we had to do... Uh, Kissinger certainly was in, in favor of <clears throat> the mining of Haiphong mm -hmm. and the bombing of on Hanoi, but uh, he was more worried about whether we would lose uh, the summit, although he was willing to do that. So what was it like for that couple of days in the White House? When you, the mining of Haiphong Harbor happens, you don't know what the Soviet response is or the Chinese response. Were you worried this could escalate? You could have a Cuban missile crisis on your hands? Well, I, Kissinger, I think, has said that the, the, he felt the whole fate of our foreign policy was in the works here, both what was going to happen in Vietnam, the opening to Russia, and therefore our leverage with the Chinese, so that this was a very tense yeah. week. And we were very nervous when we went up to Camp David uh, uh, to do this speech, but it turned out very successfully. I, I was too busy working on the uh, SALT agreement at mm -hmm. that time. The other thing that happened in April during that secret trip uh, was Brezhnev actually came back with a proposal which met our major concerns, um, a, a limited ABM employment deployment on either side, and uh, including SLBM, submarine launch missiles, in the negotiations. And he came up with a number of 950 missiles and I think it was 62 boats. And he proposed that. And I remember we had the verification panel. We had all of the experts around there trying to figure out where in the hell did 950 come from because mm -hmm. they had a certain number of missiles on their submarines. And we did all kinds of calculations on how in the world they could match the number of boats with the, uh, with the missiles. But that was a huge breakthrough. That was really the thing that... 
that really was critical to going ahead with an agreement at, in, at the summit. If we hadn't yeah. gotten those resolved, it would have been a very tough now, That's why when Henry reported this, he thought he would get pats on the back from Nixon, but Nixon was still mad about the Soviets not helping uh, on Vietnam. Vietnam. Uh, but I, I want to say that I don't want to exaggerate this. Nixon was happy with the general outcome as the more he thought about it. Uh, but he always felt that the Russians should do more than Henry felt was real, realistic. It seems like that this is where it all comes together, is that that couple of days, the mining of Haiphong Harbor, that's the Vietnam War issue. It's would the Chinese respond? Right. How would the Soviet Union respond? And, and those sort of five or six days, you well, went into them not knowing, and you walked out of them well, knowing. Well, because in the rest of 72, you had the trifecta of a Vietnam peace agreement, uh, opening not into China, but liaison offices like embassies uh, and detente with the Russians and the summit. There were some lighter moments at the summit very quickly, but first of all, the most hair-raising experiences of my life are, uh, are Soviet motorcades. I'm sure we've all been through those. <laughs> yeah. They go about 100 miles an hour and they tailgate each other. And so if you had one guy stop, you'd have the leadership of both uh, Russia and the United States totally wiped out. <laughs> Secondly, we got to the guest house where we stayed and for some reason, all the uh, attendants and people taking care of their rooms were very attractive young women. Uh, I think they were trying to get some blackmail pictures, and of course, they did not succeed. And then finally, because we knew we were being bugged, we had an insane invention called, we called the babbler machine. Yeah. This consists of recordings <laughs> of about 15 different conversations, none of which make sense anyway, all going on at the same time. It was like a terrible cocktail party or something. <laughs> And you're supposed to speak uh, softly, and this thing would drown out Soviet eavesdropping, but we could go about two minutes before we went totally insane. <laughs> and the final thing the Russians did to us then was... Then the walk in the garden. <laughs> yeah. well, well, the garden, we figured the trees were bugged as well. That's right. <laughs> and the final indignity was we had pool table there. I swear to God that the holes were smaller than the balls. <laughs> and so you couldn't get the balls go in the holes. So the Russians are doing all kinds of stuff. Psychological right. warfare. Right. You know, there was an incident. Uh, the, the next year I was with Henry there to visit with Brezhnev, and, and we were very concerned. Same <coughs> issue. We hated the babbler. So we, would, we had to find a place to go for walks, and we'd have to find big open fields to walk because they actually had uh, the NSA picked up that the Russians had bugged uh, de Gaulle when he was in Moscow. They'd bugged the trees in the garden. Well, he was tall. It was really true, and, and so we had to be very <laughs> And the babbler killed you. You just couldn't do that for more than uh, you know, a minute or two. Well, so. Henry always had fun with Gromyko in this, because he would he'd be in a meeting and say, here's my top secret briefing book. Which chandelier should I hold it up to? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> there was another incident like that, that, that next, the next year we were, uh, and the earlier ones, they had lots of caviar all the time. And in early 73, there was no caviar. We were out at this Zavitovo, this uh, camp way outside of Moscow. And uh, Bill Hyland in particular loved caviar. So um, at, at breakfast we'd say, isn't it strange there's no caviar today? And at lunch <laughs> we'd say that the next day caviar was everywhere. You know? <laughs> well, I did that in yeah. China, guest house. I'd say, yeah. I hate sea slugs, and we wouldn't get sea slugs at the next <laughs> banquet. So that was good. <laughs> Talk to me about the, the summit. Okay, so you, you, know, you didn't know if it was going to happen, and then it actually happened. So you go on the summit. Was everything agreed to by the time you set off in the briefing books on the way to Moscow? Or well, not on the salt not side. Not on arms control. Were, These guys yeah. ought to take you through. Well, there were still some issues. The, uh, um, uh, the, one of the issues was expanding the size of the silos because we suspected, and later on found out it was true, that they were building a, another set of missiles that were, were slightly bigger than the existing ones and be a lot more capable. And so the agreement at earlier uh, in, uh, in April was they wouldn't make significant increases in silos. Well, uh, nobody liked that very well because who knows what the Russians would consider secret, uh, significant. So they had to negotiate that. What was the, uh, um, what was, and they finally agreed on 10 to 15 percent. And secondly, there were going to be two ABM sites at that time. One of them we felt strongly had to be east of the Urals, so it didn't have pop population uh, coverage. And the Russians uh, were reluctant to do that. Uh, and there was one other. I might and like, so these were all things that weren't decided upon weren't decided. before you actually. They weren't decided, exactly. So it could have gone yeah. very badly at that summit. Yeah. Then there were some arguments over some of the older Russian submarines, mm. something called G class, that, were, that carried nuclear missiles, but they were diesel powered. And the Russians said, well, they're, they're, they should be counted, and so we can replace them with new modern ones. And we said, no, they don't count. 
And so those are the three issues that were battled out really with the, Within the, the president. Last... And, and, and then finally, I think they sent, uh, I guess, Gromico and Henry off to uh, settle them in the middle of the night. So well, they're... yeah, you can get back to that. But I, I think we'd all agree that summits, you generally want to have everything worked out in advance. You don't want to negotiate at the summit. Uh, and in this case, it really was negotiated there, but the rest of the summit was pre-negotiated. Mm -hmm. We had an incidents at sea agreement, it was quite so our navies wouldn't collide. Uh, all of these were worked out in environmental agreement, space agreement. Uh, so there were other and aspects it should which be said that didn't get the headlines, but it was significant. The Russians, uh, the Soviets, loved agreements. Right. They loved to have pictures taken with everybody there. Signing, signing ceremonies. Some <laughs> of these were not terribly uh, significant, but the Russians put a lot of store uh -huh. on how many agreements could be signed at a meeting like that. Yeah, we've got a picture now of everybody standing by and overlooking. So how many agreements were signed at the Moscow summit? I don't remember, but there would have been you know, at least half a dozen of the, of the kind I just mentioned, mm -hmm. incidents at sea, space, environment. Some of those were signed just yeah. by the, the uh, foreign ministers yeah. and not by the... Uh, you know, it's also worth, was it's agreement worth, to set up an economic commission. Excuse me. Yeah. I, no, I was just going to say uh, this. This summitry was uh, just getting started, but it, interesting uh, result of this was uh, what actually was probably a mistake. Going back to this issue of the missile silos and the size and the fifteen percent. First of all, our dear friend Bill Hyland loved to put these ranges in, so he would say 10-15, and we'd say, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it, I mean, you can go up to 15, right? And yeah, so uh, it wasn't clear what the 10 was in there, so there was that little kind of funny yeah. thing. But the problem was that uh, uh, it wasn't understood that what really mattered is the volume of the silo, not some single dimension, like its height of 15%. And so it turns out if you increase the radius of the circle by 15% and the height by 15%, you get more than a 50% increase in the size of the silo. And so uh, this led to uh, a lot of political problems with the agreement because it turns out that uh, the Russians were able to put in silos of this size, limited this way, a much bigger missile yeah. uh, than what had been anticipated or even really what had been briefed in the initial briefings of the agreement. So Senator Jackson in particular uh, uh, helped by his staff guy, Richard Pearl, uh, made uh, a lot of uh, noise about this for a very long time to come. Uh, and uh, later, we came to understand that uh, the Soviets did understand this, and they had this bigger missile already uh, in place. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was six times the capability of, at, actually more than that, because it was also more accurate, yeah. probably ten times, the capability of the ones it was replacing and what were supposed to be just modernized silos. You know, that the interesting thing was it was not just Bill Hyland and my lack of engineering background, but the Joint Chiefs of Staff were perfectly happy with the 10 15 percent. That was they supported that, they were they accepted it. Now maybe they had the same plan at the back of their mind didn't tell us, but uh, mm -hmm. they were not unhappy with that. But later on it turned out it was well, meanwhile while the negotiations are going on, Gumiko and Kissinger and so on. Uh, you had the arms control agency led by Jerry Smith in Helsinki, and there was a lot of back and forth and considerable tension uh, about what was being negotiated. But you guys would know more yeah. about that. There were that a lot matter. of nitty gritty details that had to get, you know, that, on this, all these things that had to be agreed to. So when they, they, were, when everybody they were working down, away in Helsinki when all this was going on. So when they were signing these agreements, were all the nitty gritty details already dealt with? Uh, uh, more or less. Yeah. Okay, so the nitty gritty details are done. You walk away from the Moscow summit. Well, could I? Uh, yeah. the, the last session you alluded to was Gromyko and Kissinger. I ought to quickly explain how yes. we got there. But let me pause for a minute. We would all agree that the two people missing today, <coughs> that the most central people, I think, yeah. in the overall relationship, Helmut Sonnefeld and William Hyland, and I just want to pay tribute to them because yeah. Yeah. they Absolutely. were fantastic. And uh, I really wish they could be here yes. uh, uh, to, to join yeah. us. Mm -hmm. uh, the last session came after a session on Vietnam. Now, uh, we discussed this in the Vietnam series. I'm trying to promote all these uh, yeah. tapes here. <laughs> but essentially, uh, yeah. we've given the background about the Easter Offensive and the Russians. Uh, nevertheless, even though we were bombing Hanoi and mining Haiphong, uh, 
uh, at which <coughs> the North Vietnamese didn't particularly like. Here they were welcoming the American president, signing agreements, and toasting. So the Russians had to be very tough with us, but it didn't mean anything operationally. So they could send a transcript of a tough meeting back to Hanoi, showing their friends that they hadn't let them down. So there was a special meeting to take place at a dacha outside of Moscow. A space agreement was signed. There was supposed to be a half hour interval uh, in which uh, the president and Brezhnev get ready to go out to the dacha. Brezhnev grabbed the president and went right off in the motorcade, which is okay except for me and a guy named Negra Pani had all the briefing books on Vietnam and everything else, and we missed the motorcade. It is not recommended <laughs> that you miss a presidential motorcade. Particularly, that includes not only the president, but someone named Henry Kissinger, who might not be pleased either. To Henry's credit, he understood it wasn't our fault, but we went crazy trying to get out there because <laughs> of security. Luckily, it didn't matter because Brezhnev took Nixon out on a power boat on the lake uh, to relax things. So anyway, we went to the Vietnam meeting. Four hours brutal attacks by uh, Brezhnev, Podgorny, and Kasiga, the three top leaders, and the other person there was the National Security Advisor, and then there was Nixon, Kissinger, myself, and Negroponte. Nixon took it calmly, knew they were making a transcript for Hanoi. As soon as the meeting ended, we go upstairs, everyone starts celebrating, Brezhnev first, getting, trying to get people drunk, the whole mood absolutely changed. And one reason he tried to get everyone drunk is because we went from there over to the Kremlin uh, to negotiate the final elements of the SALT agreement. Now that, when it was first briefed to the press, was not very effectively done, and Kissinger and Smith had some tensions, and the press was having a field day. So Henry had to have another press conference, which he did on his 49th birthday in the Starry Sky restaurant or someplace, National Hotel, yeah. National hotel in Tourist Hotel, uh, and briefed uh, that night on the final SALT agreement. Yeah, they were, uh, Smith and the delegation were going to come for the signing, of course, and so we sent a plane, but the, apparently the Air Force sent a prop plane, and it was a very slow <laughs> plane, and they put the Russian delegation on. I'm sure and it And so wasn't they had deliberate. to keep delaying the signing because they were still trying to get to Moscow, and then they had trouble, the cars, uh, security wouldn't let the government cars on, I mean, it was a whole, just a fiasco, but they eventually got there, and I don't know how late they signed it, but it was signed quite late in the evening. Well, and then Gerard Smith, who was, in principle, the top negotiator, actually had not been informed about what he was there to watch being signed. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was some yeah. unfortunate, and Henry admits sure, this, Henry uh, human elements. Uh, the secrecy which made breakthroughs, not only on this, but on China and Vietnam and so on, you can justify, and we've talked about it when we talked about the NEC system, another tape we've done, uh, but <coughs> it did mean some, some humiliating aspects for other parts of the bureaucracy uh, and, and, and the and, Congress and, and, and the, the public and the public. Yeah. So there were trade-offs. I would argue that it was worth it, but it clearly was a bizarre was system and sometimes yeah. uh, not very sensitive. Yeah, there was this terrible worry about leaks, of course, during all of this. And in and, and seventy-two, the uh, or seventy-one, after the uh, uh, the, sign, the the May agreement, we had a very elaborate position on SLBMs and missiles and everything that was going to go to the next round of salt negotiations. And Bill Beecher, who many of you may remember, got a complete debrief on it from someone, and the New York Times spread it across page one. And I think it actually came out before the delegation had received the instructions. It was a horrible embarrassment, whether it mattered or not, I don't know. But well, there was, was a Beecher, huge another Beecher report on Cambodia, which led, frankly, because of concern over lakes, to, to wiretapping. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. in the but White that's House. for another conversation. That's another conversation. Um, Get to the back, to the end of 1972 now. Kissinger and Nixon have had these, it's been a phenomenal year, yeah. right? They've had the China summit, they've had the Moscow summit, arms control agreements, Vietnam is winding down almost to an end. Richard Nixon wins a landslide re-election victory in November. And then what happens? You would assume at that point there's another round of arms control coming. Um, Jan, you were at that point starting to transition into the I think White House. It was House. just before Jan came, I think. Yeah, uh, when you did the we started, I think, the first. So we made good progress until Lodo arrived. Until Lodo yeah. got yeah, there, exactly. But, but we had our first, uh, first, I think, negotiations in the fall and, and then another set in the spring of, of 73. We had another trip to Moscow, a secret trip to Moscow, and we talked among a whole bunch of things to get ready for President's visit to the United States. But uh, MBFR, mutual reductions in Europe, and SALT II were on the agenda, and they were discussed. And, and so we made some modest progress, but then, of course, 
Watergate happened, and there when did you thought about that? Famous 73, uh, what was it called? I remember Highland wrote it one evening, uh, the, the very vague general agreement on nuclear stability or whatever uh, that was stuck in there at the last minute because there wasn't a substantive yeah. movement forward. But then, but 1973 then, it, it explain sort of what happened in the country and, and why did it all just sort of, you know, kind of evaporate? Watergate. Were, wa Watergate. You would think it's really primarily Watergate? Oh, yeah. Well, that plus all of the movement against uh, Vietnam among the public, the demonstrations, <coughs> uh, and, you know, hubris, I think, set in mm -hmm. as far as the president was concerned. Uh, here he came off a tremendous victory at the polls, and yet, you know, he started or approved uh, of what some of his advisors were telling him to do in this crazy Watergate caper, which he definitely knew about. Uh, that happened, of course, during the election before. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, you know, it just seemed so out of character for somebody to feel that they after this tremendous victory at the polls, needed to go into this kind of uh, nonsensical. Explain to me what happened then for, you know, Winston, you talked from the very beginning about the carrots and sticks you were able right. to use with, with China, with Russia, with right. Vietnam. And then what happened to all the carrots and well, sticks by 1973? Th this was the problem. As Watergate took more and more attention on the world stage and more and more distraction for Nixon, uh, momentum on all these fronts slowed down. I think one of Kissinger's greatest achievements was to keep things going as well as he did, almost by himself, mm -hmm. uh, as this began to overtake us. So what happened was, as we said at the outset, dealing with, a, with the Soviets required carrots and sticks, and we were losing both. You had the left that, uh, that hated Nixon, and you had the right that hated communism. Uh, you had on the left uh, concern that not enough attention was being paid to human rights. Uh, and it, even if Nixon did something right, they didn't particularly like him. You had on the right feeling that Nixon and Kissinger with detente were too soft on the Russians. And so you had a series of things happen. You had a combination, and these gentlemen will get into this, uh, of Senator Jackson uh, plus the Secretary of Defense, essentially, uh, undercutting uh, the ongoing SALT II negotiations. You had Jackson introducing the Jackson-Vanik Amendment on most favored nation trade relations with Moscow over the question of emigration of Jews. Uh, and so the carrots with the Soviets, namely economic relations and arms control, uh, were being eaten up, if I could maintain the metaphor. And the, the sticks uh, with the attack on intelligence agencies Congressional restrictions, War Powers war Act, powers, right, yeah. uh, uh, resistance to increasing the defense budget mm -hmm. uh, took away our sticks. So therefore, Brezhnev saw, uh, even though he himself, like the Chinese, felt they couldn't understand why Watergate was such a big deal, they saw that it meant that the president didn't have the strength and the leverage either to negotiate hard or to carry through on agreements. Mm -hmm. And so then when you were trying to negotiate, Jan Lodl, um, the, the next round of SALT talks, um, you had Nixon, uh, Brezhnev came to the United States um, in, the, in June of 1973, and we, there they are, what must have been an extraordinary moment for Brezhnev and for Nixon, at the White House, waving to the crowds, then going to the West Coast, um, San Clemente, as well as also going to Camp David. So Brezhnev saw everything great about America, it was a, it was a great moment, in 1970, um, 1973, but then you were trying to negotiate the next round in this period of American weakness where the carrots and sticks weren't there. So what was happening with the ability to then do SALT II and to the, do the next round? Well, there, there were several uh, important factors that we have to remember. Uh, uh, war broke out again in the Middle East, and we had an oil embargo, and these were the major focus uh, points. Um, Kissinger spent, I think, 35 days in a row on the shuttle trying to bring about an end to the war. Uh, there had been the uh, upping of our nuclear security alert during the war. Uh, 
which was meant, among other things, to communicate a message to the, uh, to the Soviets, although there were actually some technical reasons for it also. That's a long story. But in any event, uh, you know, so relationships uh, with uh, the Soviet Union were not great in that respect. We had some real mm -hmm. serious tensions there uh, across the board. Meanwhile, uh, the Watergate uh, investigation uh, continued apace and didn't go away. Quite to the contrary, new revelations were continuing to come out, not daily, but fairly frequently uh, during all of this, and people were <coughs> raising questions. And uh, so all of these things uh, provided a uh, difficult backdrop for mm -hmm. trying to make progress on uh, a SALT II uh, negotiation. So the heady progress you had had <coughs> in 1972 and three, really by the end of 1973, had dissipated. Yeah, and I, I think there was also something of a, of a crisis of uh, conceptual crisis in arm control at that point. Oh. Uh, well, we had basically settled that we weren't going to have significant ABMs. So this really huge potential technological game changer in the nuclear arms race was off the table. We had more or less agreed neither of us were going to be able to build them in a way that could fundamentally change the strategic balance. Uh, and once that happened, uh, then you were left with the question of deterrence and strategic stability. And the balance, even though both sides were continuing to add weapons and build up to some extent, uh, was pretty stable. And uh, the Russians finished their Mervine program with their multiple warheads, and we had more or less finished ours. And uh, we ended up with kind of a stable set of systems. And so there was just less, uh, less of a compulsion to try to do something about what looked like it could be uh, a catastrophic uh, confrontation between the, uh, between the two powers. So I think you had that in addition to all these other things. And nonetheless, there was a desire to move forward. Uh, that then led to a whole bunch of conceptual arguments. Uh, Jim Schlesinger, who was uh, Secretary of Defense during that time, was kind of leading the charge along with uh, Senator Jackson. He and Senator Jackson actually were working together, uh, a, a sign of the, the, the weakness of the White House and of the President that that, that he could get away with working with uh, uh, a senator from the other party who had been very critical of the administration, but he did. And uh, he was against the major conceptual approach to the follow-on uh, assault to negotiations that we had worked out inside the government and the president had approved and so forth, which was called offsetting asymmetries. Uh, we had these uh, much better MIRV missiles. The Russians had these big missiles and more of them. And so the idea was to not necessarily just have equal numbers of everything, but try to have something that more accurately reflected overall capabilities. And we had a thing called offsetting aggregates. And Schlesinger came to oppose that vehemently. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, that, that I think, uh, uh, made it impossible to get an agreement because uh, uh, he opposed it right at the last minute before the final summit in 74, after all the preparation had been done to do something with equal aggregates. And uh, the president was getting quite weak at that point and decided he had to go along with Schlesinger's approach. So that was kind of dumped on the table with the Russians at the last minute and uh, didn't go anywhere. Nixon resigns in August of 1974. We had an ongoing relationship with the Chinese, with the Vietnamese, well, we didn't with the South Vietnamese, and then with the Soviet <coughs> Union. Talk to me about, because you were, except for um, Phil Odin, you were all part of the transition. How did that work? You went from one president to another. You had ongoing relations. The United States was not exploited during this period. What are your thoughts about how that? Before getting to that, can we make one last yeah, sure. on the Nixon administration itself? And that was, and we'll do this briefly, and you've had a Middle East uh, tape, uh, because you mentioned the alert and how we got to the alert. In, in October 1973, the Yom Kippur War broke out with the Egyptians uh, attacking the Israelis. Mm -hmm. uh, to make a long story short, uh, we, it reached a point where, for the first time, Israel had suffered a blow and was on a defensive temporarily, and therefore uh, their complete self-assurance of security was somewhat undermined. On the other hand, they counterattacked and pushed back the Egyptians that had surrounded the Egyptian army uh, so that they were not, they, they feel they were still the stronger. But the Arabs, for the first time, had a sort of a semi-victory and they had psychological pride. However, 
with the Egyptian army surrounded, if Israel had wiped them out, we would have been back to where we were. Henry and Nixon saw an opportunity with the balance of forces psychologically for the first time on each side seeing a need to negotiate to try to freeze that situation and a ceasefire. And the Russians were important because we had to do it with them and through the UN Security Council. So we took off on another trip uh, to Moscow uh, to, to pull this off. And we got Russian agreement to instruct the Israelis, the Egyptians, and the UN to have a ceasefire in place. The problem was the key cable getting out to tell the Israelis this and Washington. We couldn't get out for mechanical reasons. Henry went to bed having issued the cable. He got back up after his nap, came in. There were 30 people in the room. Everyone knew the cable had not gone out, and Henry Kissinger would not be overly pleased by this. And it was a serious issue, because every hour counted to make sure the ceasefire froze in place before the Israelis wiped out the, the <coughs> Eagleburger, to his credit, uh, is pointed out that I was the only one who stuck by 28 people left the room, and Kissinger came in. Of course, it was not a lot of fun. We never know what happened, whether the Russians were messing around with our communications or whatever. I won't go into detail. Anyway, but to make a long story short, that was achieved working with the Russians. But then there was violations, including by the Israelis. The Russians threatened. Uh, they came in and said, why don't US and Soviet forces go in together into the Middle East to solve this? Kissinger's strategy for four years was to keep the Russians out of the Middle East. If they got involved in the negotiating process, they would be the Arabs' lawyer. We'd have to be Israeli lawyer. We wanted to be someone who could talk to both sides. So he constantly kept the Russians out of the Middle East. And in this case, the only way to keep them out because the threat was by Brezhnev in a letter that if we don't go in together, we're going in by ourselves. We went on at an alert they called DEFCON 3, a certain high level, very visible. As a result of that alert, a courageous decision by the White House, uh, the situation cooled down. And you had the beginning of Egyptian-Israeli direct negotiations, the first time between the Arabs and Israelis, and leading to the Kissinger, Kissinger shuttles after that. So, so the Middle East, um, which, as you point out, we've covered on another section, that was an opportunity that had not presented itself before That's right. for the United States. And Nixon and Kissinger Nixon. saw the, the moment mm -hmm. for the reasons I mentioned and, and moved quickly on it. And because of the relationship that he had already established with the Soviet Union, you had a little bit more of an opening. Yeah, but then you had this attack. tension because of the, uh, the, they knew that Nixon was weaker now, so they threatened to intervene, and, and it was only the alert that sort of uh, stayed mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. Are there any final thoughts that you have? I mean, we've, we've talked about a number of things, secrecy versus transparency. You know, maybe, as you point out, you could, probably couldn't have gotten it without the secrecy. On the other hand, you paid a price for it. Could we have gotten a better deal from the Soviet Union, especially at the end of the Nixon administration, the effect of Watergate? I mean, what are, just what are your final thoughts? And let me start I with you, Jan. I'm talking about that last summit. Uh, I think I was the only one here still standing at that point. And uh, uh, in, in, in the summer of, yeah, I'm sorry. Our, that's right. You and I were together, absolutely. And this was uh, the summit at Yalta, uh, but we didn't call it Yalta. But this that's was right. It was in July Moscow and Yalta both. And went back and forth between Black the two places. Sea. Exactly. Uh, and there was tremendous uh, concern in the press uh, and, and pressure from Nixon's uh, opponents that he would try desperately to get any kind of a deal to save his presidency from uh, the Watergate crisis, which was moving to a climax, and mm -hmm. everyone knew that, and he uh, was in office just a few more weeks after that summit. Uh, but uh, he was really very calm and cool during that summit and was not at all pressuring to get some kind of a deal. If anything, he was being overly cautious to make sure that anything that we did uh, was uh, clearly legitimate on its own terms. Uh, and we did do some things. We did a threshold test ban treaty, which had a somewhat limited impact, but was a helpful treaty later on. And uh, we uh, uh, made a deal on anti-ballistic missiles, which had been two sites and nobody we had one site, they had one site, so we agreed we'd limit it to one site. They were small things, but uh, uh, he had some opportunities to do some big things. Brezhnev tried to push him on some kind of- Did Brezhnev of, try to exploit it? Did he try to- Well, I don't think he tried to exploit it because they were, they were pretty tried and true uh, Brezhnev ploys, if you will. He retried some of them, mm -hmm. uh, in particular trying to move us back toward Russia and away from China, uh, which was one of his, his favorite ploys. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Nixon didn't bite at all on any of that. 
uh, and uh, uh, took what we could do and uh, went home. The, the interesting thing in the atmospherics was how sympathetic the Russians were, or the Soviets, to Nixon's plight, because they thought this was an absolutely false thing that was bringing this poor man down. And, uh, uh, you know, it was almost Brezhnev putting his arm around Nixon and taking him off on a garden walk and so forth. Not pressing him on, on issues, mm -hmm. but just sort of being I mean, a they friend. Did, they'd had established build him a, up. They had a real, you know, I mean, a personal relationship. Well, <laughs> Brezhnev so, tried to make it into a personal yeah. relationship. And uh, it, it concerned people like Al Haig, who was going out of his <laughs> mind, thinking that the president shouldn't be left alone with Brezhnev. Um, but nothing came out of that. But it was just a general sympathy on the part of the Soviets for this man who they thought was being put upon. Mm -hmm. But they went above using it for leverage a little bit too. I mean, well, they, they were not totally there was Mother not a Teresa. lot of evidence that yeah. they used it. But, it, but uh, Nixon resisted any temptation then. He, he most yeah. certainly did. Nothing I, actually, happened. the proof of it is that they did have a fairly long one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, and you're seeing some of it here with just Sukhodrev around. And nobody else there. Uh, he was their, uh, their interpreter who could interpret both ways. And uh, actually, uh, no one ever reported what happened in that uh, because Nixon was out of office before it was possible to get a report from him. But uh, obviously, nothing happened because the Russians never came back and said, OK, we've agreed to X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Nothing was agreed. Nothing. nothing was said. Any final thoughts, Arthur, that you have about the whole U.S.-Soviet arms control relationship? Well, about <laughs> foreign policy in general. That'll work. Uh, my feeling, having lived through a lot of this stuff, is that individuals don't often play the big role that their own spirit kind of builds up. And uh, Henry was a great one for sort of painting a picture of his role. He played a key role in the transition because really it was at a point where, you know, the United States could be taken for doing absolutely nothing and incapable of doing anything during that period. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, he kept all the balls in the air as far as the negotiations in the Middle East. Uh, he did a lot of other things to make it look like a more or less uh, normal transition. And uh, he even became a friend of the security conference, which up until that time he'd been very lukewarm about, because that was something the Europeans were interested in. And uh, under Ford, they could make the progress uh, that they <laughs> finally ended up with the Helsinki Agreement. But individuals can, I think, move a situation slightly. It's like moving a big ship. But to take credit or not take credit for major, major changes in history, I think, uh, is a great mistake. And it, it never really happens, as we see in these <laughs> historical crises that keep coming back uh, because of underlying history, underlying economic situations. Uh, so I'm, I'm less of a fan of, of the you know, an individual being able to change a whole mm -hmm. historical movement. Uh, let me come back to you at the yeah. very end, okay. Winston, to, to finish up the okay. whole series. But, <clears throat> Phil, what are your final thoughts? Well, I, I know you've had a session on the NSC system, but having been deeply involved in yes. these final, all this SALT-1 stuff, I don't know how you could have done it in a, in a more traditional kind of situation without strong... White House control over the whole process because it's an extremely complicated issue with all different kinds of weapon systems and ABM and all kinds of technical aspects and exotic systems and radars and on and on and on with really deep differences between state and ACTA and the Joint Chiefs with OSD in the middle and CIA playing a role. It would have been a, a very hard thing to do in a more traditional kind of NSC system. So I think the control that, that the White House you know, used, and Henry, the verification panel, the working group that I chaired and Jan later on chaired, mm 
uh, really made, helped make sense out of this very complicated system. And would you advise that to any future national security advisor and president, have a strongly centralized foreign policy? Well, you know, th this was a unique period in history. I, I'm not sure, but yes, clearly you want a, you want a, uh, you want a, a NSC that's, that's very effective, but you also want a very experienced one. The thing that I look back on the NSC staff, I don't know if there was anybody on the staff at the time, anybody that's pretty extreme, that didn't come out of some part of the government, out of the State Department, the CIA, OSD, the Joint Staff, someplace. So you had a whole series of very experienced people that really, understand, really understood how government operated and were able to work closely with their agencies. Part of it was I had all these contacts, the Joint Staff and OSD. Uh, I'm sure you know, uh, the other people of Staff Highland and Sonnenfeld with CIA and, and State, I mean, it was really, it made working together uh, work well and the NSC staff could play a very constructive role and a reasonably independent one. I mean, we weren't, uh, you know, we really tried to present the options and alternatives fairly. Uh, so I think it worked quite well and I would commend that broad thought to a future President and National but Security Advisor. Put against that, that when Henry moved over to the State Department, he brought a lot of power with him. He did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And from then on really ran policy during the Ford administration from his point, uh, his position as Secretary of State. I think what's happened today, today the NSC staff is 10 times the size it was when we were there. Yeah. Uh, now, that didn't just happen in and this maybe administration. Maybe one the capability. Yeah, right. It didn't happen yeah. just in this administration. That was mostly done even before President Obama's time, but, you know, he, I think, added even a little bit more. But the, what happens when you get such a big central staff like that is you don't really get a team that's small enough to be focused on the president and helping the president do what he should do. And you also make interagency work much harder having all those people in the center because they come to think, well, we don't need to have any staff support from them. We've got all kinds of people here who already know that. Mm -hmm. So you have a government inside a government as opposed to an organization that's supposed to be coordinating, managing, interacting with the government. I think, uh, I, I'll let the others speak for themselves, but I always felt we had very good relationships with the various departments, yes. and they appreciated <clears throat> that there needed to be someone who could bring state and defense and, and bring the uh, CIA in, and that, that we were, uh, you know, uh, uh, objective. Yes, maybe the president uh, uh, kept his own counsel to the last minute, and uh, that was true for us as well as them, and they weren't told everything that was going on, but they understood the importance of that. So I think that it was a good model for how to do things. It was uh, carried on later. General Scowcroft carried it on during his, during his years, and I think had some, had some success with it. Okay, Winston, I'll let you be the... Well, Jan is, I think, very brilliantly uh, preempted one of my points about how this NSC system has gotten out of control with 400, for all the reasons you mentioned. Uh, in terms of relationships, it was despite the fact everything was done out of the White House and a lot of secrecy, they're very systematic interagency study and conceptual strategic stuff, and including arms control and other areas, cooperation. <coughs> but it is fair to say there was intense irritation over the secrecy of Vietnam and China sure. and dealing with Dobrina by Rogers and others, so we have to give a balanced uh, picture. Very quickly, you mentioned Helsinki. Under Ford, there was the Conference in Security uh, uh, in, in Europe, there were three baskets, and, and Henry and, and, and Nixon were somewhat uh, suspect. But it turns out, after the first basket of no border changes and the second one of economic and cultural exchanges, the third one was the most important was on human rights. Uh, people like uh, Havo and uh, Valencia ran with this, and it was a tremendous uh, weapon against the Russians and their control of their empire, uh, which was ironic since they were the ones in favor originally. Yeah. Now. Uh, a couple other points. Uh, clearly, underlying forces of history and, uh, and geopolitics, economics are crucial. And we shouldn't exaggerate individuals. But I would have some disagreement with one of our most distinguished diplomats in, in, in our generation. Uh, I do think, uh, and this is not here to advertise uh, Nixon or Kissinger, but I do think these people really made a huge difference. And a lot of these breakthroughs we're talking about uh, were not just the forces of history, but took real uh, leadership and courage. Uh, the final point I would make is what we learned from our approach to the Soviets is relevant even as we speak. Namely, you cannot separate out sticks and carrots. You cannot separate out willing to confront and willing to negotiate. 
That's what Nixon wanted to do with, with the Soviets, and he did it very well, in my opinion. And it's artificial and dangerous to say, well, let's just negotiate. Let's not antagonize the other sides by being tough. We're seeing that as we speak on the Ukraine. Uh, you've got to have both force and diplomacy to be successful. So that's one of the key principles I would take out of this uh, era of the Nixon uh, policy toward uh, the Soviet Union. And I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and say that having moderated several of these panels, what strikes me is a couple of things. When Nixon and Kissinger came into office, they had a plan, and it was a comprehensive plan, and it was a strategic plan, and it had many moving parts, and they were able to execute that plan. One of the reasons they were able to execute it was they chose the right people. And Jan, as you pointed out, they had a small team, and they gave a lot of responsibility to people who were then quite young, um, you know, in their 30s, early 40s. And as we have all participated, we all went back to a Henry Kissinger reunion about five years ago that it was at the Lodal House, and they invited everyone who had worked for Kissinger. And what was stunning to all of us is if you looked around the room, Kissinger's young junior staffers who were working all night and got, you know, as Winston said, we were all so nervous Kissinger was going to get mad at us when we screwed up. But yet there was a whole generation that was trained. And it was a small generation. But it was people who then went on to be secretaries of state, to be cabinet officers, NSC advisors, ambassadors. Arthur was ambassador to the Soviet Union when it collapsed. So all of the people who were young junior staffers looked and saw what was capable, what was possible if you dreamed great dreams. And then you were all able to carry that on. So for a generation, you and the Kissinger-Nixon legacy lived on. They may have been out of office, but their legacy lived on through people like you. So I think the nation, in fact, the world probably owes you all a great debt of gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank, thank you. you all for joining us. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> well done. Got a big bad cold taking take it over here. What's that? Got a big cold going on. Oh, you know, I, I have a